So I just first want to start by welcoming everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Heather Diaz and I'm an information service librarian at Forbes. Um, I want to begin this event by acknowledging that the library and also my apartment uh, stand on Nonatuck land. So that's where I'm speaking to you from. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohegan to the west, and the Avenaki to the north. Um, for those of y'all in attendance tonight, you can use the chat to post questions or comments as we go along. And also if you're having technical problems, you can use the chat to send me a message and I'll do what I can to help you from afar. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to call on people to unmute themselves and ask their own questions as well. And um, one final note before I pass it off to Carolyn, and that is that we are recording this event. Um, it will be posted on the Forbes Library YouTube page. Um, and I will give Carolyn the link as well so she can send it out to her list afterwards. So I will pass it off to you, Carolyn. Thank you. So I'm very, very excited about tonight. These are bleak times. I'm feeling very blue about what we're heading into and it just seemed so one oh so somebody is saying that the volume is too low is there any way to turn it up is that our individual you sound pretty good to me what you sound okay. good to me to me Sounds yeah good to I'll, me. I'll message with uh this person and see if we can work it out okay so I, <clears throat> when this film fell in my lap, and I have to say, I honestly don't remember now how that happened. <clears throat> it seemed the perfect thing to do right before the election to get together and have a big gab fest about democracy. And this film just lays out a smorgasbord of things for us to tear into. But I wanna say something for those who don't know the Francis Crow film series is hosted by the Forbes Library in Northampton. Thanks to COVID and Zoom, we can be from all over now and not have to drive in the rain to Forbes Library. But I think it's symbolic and important that we're doing this through a library because the library is one of the fundamental democratic institutions. My immigrant grandmother told me when I asked her as a child, why did you come here? she said, for free public libraries for my children. And I always thought about that because we take it for granted, but don't, you know? So to me, it's a symbolic place for which to be having fundamental democratic discussions. And that is so much what this film is about. Now, the filmmaker, Astra Taylor, it's hard to just, there she is waving. Um, it's hard to give a bio of her without taking half an hour, which is really something. She is a Renaissance person, a filmmaker, an author, an activist, and on so many subjects, um, as you'll get a sense of it from the film. Um, but I'll ask Will Meyer, who's also one of our speakers tonight to say a little more because he's worked closely with her as a research assistant. Um, and Will is, we have a format. Oh, the Francis Crow film series is named for Francis Crow, who died a year ago at 100, who was an iconic activist, very well known in Western Mass and had some national reputation in anti-war circles. Um, and she started this democratic film series. I mean, she her idea was to take important subjects of, for social justice and social change, show films and then bring people together to talk about it, which is a very democratic process. And I worked with her very closely in the last years and then she died and I was sort of left holding the bag. Um, and then I got excited about doing it my own way, which with Francis was always a negotiation, of course, because anyway, that. And um, 
my format is to try to find some current cutting edge film that isn't just something that's been sitting around for a long time because there's a difference between this film series and showing a film in an academic class. The purpose of this film series is spur people to get on and do something. And so the closer to current the film is, the more it leads us. And then to always have some local person who's involved in that subject. Now, Will is the co-editor of The Shoestring, which is an online, I guess it can be called a muck, it's, people call it a muckraking publication. It's really doing what good journalism is. I used to be a journalist and that's what good journalism is muckraking. Um, and he, their focus is to keep a beacon on the city of Northampton. It's a microcosm of corruption everywhere and they do a great job. So I'm turning it over to you, Will, and um, say a few words and say more about Astra and then we'll open it up. Yeah, um, well, uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, for, for having us. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. I want to say hi to my, my grandma, Roxy, who's on the, on the call. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yes, uh, I, I have the, the tall task of uh, introducing my, my good friend, uh, Astra, who is um, a writer, um, a filmmaker, um, sh her... I, I came to know her work through her first book, The People's Platform, about uh, the, the promise of democracy on the internet and how it wasn't realized um, by big, big tech companies, essentially. Um, and and um, she has made several films, uh, including uh, this one, which is available on DVD at the Forbes Library. And I think Examine Life is also on DVD at the Forbes Library. Uh, her new book is called Democracy May Not Exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. Um, and I, I did some research for that. Um, and her writing has appeared in everything from the, the Baffler and N plus one to the New York Times and CNN and all kinds of places, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> but I guess, um, I guess I can, I can kind of start by, by asking, um, maybe Astra a question about, um, the movie and, um, um, uh, how, 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 cause I think, you know, Carolyn said, uh, in her introduction just now that, you know, a, a film, the point of the series is, is to kind of provoke, but I think this movie is kind of asking us to, to reflect on what democracy is. And I think Astra, your contention is that in order to, to be a democratic people, essentially, in order to, to rule ourselves, that's what, that's what you're asking us to do. We have to be able to reflect and to engage uh, in ways that, that go uh, beyond the kind of the shallow, um, surface so how do, how do you sort of um we're living in this time time of of great urgency where where we feel like we're on the precipice of uh calamity and disaster which is occurring before our eyes uh yet at the same time uh we need to be able to um to engage i think in the way that you're asking us maybe maybe even more slowly or more carefully or, or more thoughtfully. So do you want to take it from there? Yeah. yeah, thanks everyone for this kind introduction, everyone for watching my film and for being here. Um, Carolyn and Heather, thanks for, for hosting. Um, wonderful to learn about Francis Crow. And you know, I invited Will to participate because Will is did some research assisting for me, but is really a comrade and someone I'm learning from. And I just, I so admire the spirit of the shoestring, which is yeah, muckraking on a hyper-local level. Um, journalism as a kind of punk rock political enterprise, you know, and it's like, let's, you know, that, that we can actually take this on, on ourselves and do it because it's something that, that needs to be done. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there's, um, you know, like so many important arenas, journalism is facing a, a crisis right now because of um, the, the shift in funding structures. So, uh, you know, and, and, the other thing I do, I think that's important to put on the table is that I co-founded something called the Debt Collective. So it's a union for debtors um, where we are trying to build new forms of economic power. It's really, I think, an important mode of organizing right now in a pandemic because what we have are you know, tens of millions of jobs that disappeared overnight. That means people you know, 
are sinking further into debt um, in delinquency and despair. And so we're trying to uh, build power there uh, as part of a just recovery to this crisis. So yeah, I think democracy is, uh, the book is where I really you know, get to nerd out. Films are interesting creations because you have to, um, you know, you have to keep it moving. You can't have all the footnotes and all the details, but you know, part of what I think I took away from making the film and writing the book is that democracy is this paradoxical thing. It's both a, an aspiration and you know, a reality. It is an ideal and it's a, it's a practice. Um, and in fact, the book is arranged, uh, each chapter is kind of one of these, what I see as an irreducible tension in democracy. So freedom and equality, the present and the future, the local and the global. And that part of why democracy is so hard and so frustrating is that we have to hold these things in tension. We can't sort of come on one side or the other. So another paradox is, stru is structure and spontaneity. So the, yes, the rule of law, but also revolt <laughs> and resistance. So trying to think about, you know, what, uh, what democracy requires. And so it, it is both a sort of, it requires this philosophical engagement, sort of stepping back thinking about these big questions and it requires building power on the ground and actually trying to you know fight the status quo and I think one I've always loved philosophy it just you know I'm not trained in it it's just something that I care a lot about and that I've merged with my filmmaking I make philosophical films and I think one thing on the one hand democracy seems to be uh you know uh part of I guess at this moment right there's just a lot of um, misguided opinion. I mean, it seems like not a very wise enterprise in a lot of ways, but democracy requires philosophy. Um, you know, this question, and this is maybe I'll, I'll hand it off after this, but this question of um, the idea of democracy is that the people rule. And as I, I think I try to get at this in the film, but the people is an abstraction. We, the demos. And so from the very get go, you have to engage in a kind of philosophical reflection. If you live under a monarchy, you can point to the king and say, they rule, that's the person who makes decisions. In a democracy, it's this abstract thing, this you know, social construction, the we. And that we is you know, something we have to think about. It's something that we can transform, we can expand it, or we can contract it. And so I think from the very, from the very beginning, you know, democracy requires this kind of critical engagement. And so what I tried to do in the film is, open that space for a critical philosophical um, engagement while also you know not shying away from the urgency of the issues that people face and in the film was conceived well before Donald Trump well before the current crisis because a lot of the things we're facing have deep deep roots they go back um, centuries but also millennia uh, and so you know we kind of we have to <laughs> have a very big canvas when we're talking about the crisis of democracy I have a question from the chat. Um, I'll read the comment. So this is from Benjamin who says, thanks for this great movie. Do you make a difference between the concepts of liberalism and democracy? Do you see a crisis of democracy or liberalism? Mm. And uh, they send greetings from Germany. Oh, neat. Uh, yeah, I do. I think there, I think, you know, democracy and liberalism are two distinct traditions. They're they're merged in lots of ways. Um, liberalism, I mean, I could make a film called What is Liberalism Next? That would be equally contentious and maybe even less of a hit. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the liberal tradition is, you know, about individual rights, um, you know, uh, protecting the individual from a, an overweening state. And so, you know, there's a strong liberal uh, tradition here. So I think but I guess I don't see it as an either or. I mean, I think what we have, I think right now the crisis we're in, um, you know, is there's, there are sort of multiple intersecting crises, right? We have incredible inequality, off the charts inequality. We have a climate catastrophe on the horizon. We have, uh, a, you know, an empowered and, and globalized resurgent right wing. Um, and then we have like the problems of that are kind of unique to the American political system. Like we have a constitution that is made to empower minority rule <laughs> through different structures, through the su Supreme Court, as we're now seeing, through the Electoral College, which you know undermines the popular vote, through the Senate, which gives disproportionate weight to smaller, less populous states. 
Um, so, you know, I think we're also facing a, a unique crisis of the American political system. And that's, I think, what we really need to face um, moving forward. You know, it doesn't have to be questions. It can be comments. Yeah. We can have a flow of conversation. Yes, Susan, did you want to go ahead? Who? Uh, Susan, um, Astra, hi, it's hey. Susan Lee from Finance at Occupy. Hey. Um, how are you? Um, was this a second cut or was this a first cut? Because um, I thought I saw a first cut a while back. And maybe it's me that changed, but I thought this one was really strong. But my question, two questions, mm -hmm. a comment question. Um, I was struck by that young woman, um, refugee, who for her, a democracy was so not what we had in mind. Mm. For her, life was, was, fuel, was food, was a roof, was security. Mm. So I thought that point was really well done. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, I didn't get a sense of what in your mind, democracy actually would look like. Mm -hmm. Was it Occupy? Was it a town council at Northampton? Mm -hmm. What was it and how would this work for a large city? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, Susan's referring to an interview with Stella Megams, who's a young woman, 21, from Aleppo, um, was fleeing mm -hmm. Syria with her younger brother. Um, and she had quite an incredible um, journey to get to where I, I met her at Piraeus Port in, in Greece. She was on her way to, to Vienna to uh, reunite with her older brother. And it took her another six months of basically being stuck outdoors to, to do that, um, to make it to her, her older brother. Um, yeah, I think it was important. I mean, I had quite a, occasionally I would have a screening where someone at the end of the film would say, you know, this is supposed to be about democracy. It's about politics, but you have all these people talking about food and shelter and, you know, their fears. And, and so part of, you know, what I wanted to, to do was to, I mean, there's, there's different things there. I mean, one, she's kind of saying, um, she's pointing out the fact that if we don't have a kind of security, right, we don't have democracy, that that's a kind of baseline, right? Like if you're living, as she says, we don't want to just live in fear and have nightmares at night that we're going to be hurt or killed. And so, you know, I think it's, it's important to recognize those, those that, that is part of democracy, right? I mean, those sort of basic things we, we take for granted. Um, and then I think she's also challenging, you know, kind of Western conception of itself. You know, she says, you know, yeah, you say you're for human rights, but you treat us terribly. <laughs> and, um, and she also later in the film, I think brings up this very important question of citizenship, right? Why are the boundaries of a community drawn in this way? Right. If I had just randomly, if I'd won the lottery of birth and been born on a different, you know, in a different geography in a different territory, I would have a whole different set of rights. And, you know, so in the book, I, for example, like talk about the fact that in the early days of this country, citizenship and voting rights weren't actually, um, uh, they weren't taken to be necessary to one another. There was what was called alien suffrage. People could vote even if they weren't citizens in some places. There was but a discrimination along other lines, you know, women can vote, but it wasn't, the citizenship uh, wasn't as significant as it is today. Um, and in other countries in New Zealand, if you're a resident for a year, you can vote for in the, you know, in, in all of the elections. So uh, I think she poses a really important question there. As far as what democracy is, you know, the film, it's, you know, I wanted to open space for people to think about that. I hope the film makes very clear that my perspective is you cannot have democracy without addressing issues of economic uh, inequality. That's why I try to thread um, attention to finance throughout the film. You know, I call myself a democratic socialist. I think that democracy isn't Occupy Wall Street. I talk a lot about Occupy Wall Street and how it actually, the failures of um, its democratic attempts kind of inspired me to ask this question of what democracy is. I, I don't think, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I think Occupy isn't something that can, that model of direct assemblies doesn't scale, but I think it's provocative. And it was something that was very critical for me and set me on this journey of, of asking the question. Um, but yeah, I think we need to figure out how to democratize the state, you know? And to me, that's something that we're still reaching for. We, we haven't gotten there yet. But in the here and now, um, you know, 
I think a space like a library, I just want to echo that, you know, is a good example of a, of a democratic, um, a democratic uh, space. Or the 500 people who were on uh, Zoom earlier this summer demanding that the Northampton uh, City Council defund the police. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious to talk about, one thing I would do when I would go around with a film was actually like talk about local issues, which is another reason I wanted to bring Will, and I know Carolyn's been active too, but you know, yeah, what are the democratic struggles um, locally? I mean, if I was making the film now, I would certainly pay a lot of attention to um, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and debates over uh, policing and, and state budgets. <laughs> Well, I think I think Delaney has uh, such a such a crucial voice um, um, in the in the film, and and directly speaking to the you know this is not what democracy feels like, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I think since we've been doing the shoestring in in twenty seventeen, we we got started kind of resisting um, the push by Chief Police Chief Jody Casper and the mayor to install surveillance cameras all throughout downtown. Northampton um, and the, the the rationale at that point to install the cameras was that they were designed to um, to 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 prevent theft downtown. So uh, the first column I think that I wrote for the shoestring uh, back at the very beginning was: Are the surveillance cameras going to prevent wage theft, which is a very pervasive form of theft against uh, workers uh, mm -hmm. who? And there, and there was a big study that uh, UMass and the Pioneer Valley Workers Center uh, did at that time. But, um, but because people showed up in the city council chamber, uh, the, the vast majority with, with a few noticeable carve outs, uh, the, the proposal was defeated. Um, and I think now, he, um, I mean, there, there, there's, there's <clears throat> with, with this summer, the, the people, um, going on Zoom and, and raising a ruckus and marching around the city council's house, city councilors' houses uh, did cut the police budget by by ten percent, um, which is which is pretty remarkable and I think one of the one of the highest cuts um, in the in the whole country. Um, and I, I, Carolyn can can speak to issues about um, the Northampton City Charter, but. At the same time, I think you know there has been efforts to um, expand expand the vote here in Northampton to to sixteen year olds, which uh, is significant and you know circles around some of the issues that you've been thinking about, Astra. Um, there are before I say anything, there are other other questions I see in the chat, Heather. Yeah, so um, Dee Dee had a question. Uh, and Daniel Levy and. Yeah, there's several in the chat, so I'm just going to kind of go in order. Um, Dee writes, you had so many fantastic ordinary interviewees. Um, Asher, can you talk about how you planned the film and planned slash found the interviewees? Uh, I wanted to make a film about democracy that, that challenged just in its whole structure who we think of as an expert in democracy, right? Because the whole idea of democracy is the people rule. And so there isn't some barrier to entry. You don't have to have a PhD in democracy to do democracy, right? That's that's part of part of the the premise is that we are engaging as as equals. And so I wanted to make a film that had a spectrum of people, you know, ranging ranging from children, because Will, as Will just pointed out, I'm very interested in the idea of, of children's rights. I think this comes from my unusual upbringing and being raised by people who are children liberationists, I suppose, having kind of radical parents. Um, and so to, you know, people who are in their, in their 80s who have a, a wealth of experience to draw on and, um, and also making a, wanting to make a feminist film. I mean, I think you can, you know, I had quite a few people watch it and they go at the end and go like, oh, actually there were a, a lot of women in that film. Um, I was very struck when I was researching my book on democracy, how few books on democracy writ large are written by women. <laughs> the only and, one was written by Condoleezza Rice. Yeah, except yeah, we found one by Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> so, um, you know, I I don't know if it's in the film or not, but at one point Sylvia Federici says, you know, democracy. It's it's we've been instructed to think it's a male it's a male business, right? It's a male enterprise. Um, so my goal in really simply was just to engage with every single person, though they were a philosopher, to engage them with respect, 
to ask them intellectual questions. They're probably not asked very much. Um, and to try to you know, meet them on that level. And people were, I think, really responsive to that. They were, you know, it was sometimes people felt really surprised that you're, oh, you're asking me these big, ide big questions about these big ideas, these big issues. Um, and I just sort of trusted my instincts when I met people. I don't know. It's not like there, there weren't a hundred interviews that I left on the floor. I basically almost used every interview I shot. Um, and I tried to approach the places I went so that they would serve as kind of parables about some of the big democratic issues I'm wrestling with. So, you know, Miami was a place where, um, you know, Black Lives Matter really kicked off. I, in fact, after Trayvon Martin was murdered. And so there were people were wrestling with, you know, what, what, uh, with civil rights and, um, uh, in this in this age of hypercapitalism, and you know, Greece served as this place where I could reflect both on sort of the the mythic legacy of democracy, or at least Western political philosophy via Plato, and the you know the economic crisis and the the refugee crisis there. So, I just you know it's such a sprawling topic. I you know on some level also just had to trust my intuition a lot. Who do I want to talk to? Who am I intrigued by? Heather, when someone asks a question, could we unmute them and let them, mm -hmm. maybe people raise hands? Sure, yeah. If you, folks in the audience, if you want to ask your own question, you can use the raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Or if you want to put in the chat, I have a question, then we can unmute you. Um, there were two related questions touching on this tradition of uh, Western political philosophy. Um, Daniel Levy had asks, how do you imagine engaging that mass of Americans divorced completely from ideas of self-rule back into this process, i.e. overcoming Rousseau's paradox? And then Tatiana asked a related question. Um, so many necessary pillars of democracy have been decimated a robust training in critical thinking, fostered sense of civic engagement, and our very capacity for self-introspection and a sense of duty to the collective rather than the self. Mm -hmm. Do you even think us capable of struggling against what Rousseau classed as our, quote, undemocratic instincts, mm -hmm. which I think you mentioned in the film. Yeah. Um, not coming from Rousseau, but Plato maybe yeah. writes about them. Um, do you think we're even capable of democracy anymore? Yeah, I guess my instinct is I'm not sure about the anymore part because I again democracy may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. I, I'm I'm resistant to and the idea we ever had democracy in this country. I mean, we've tried to have a fully inclusive uh, democracy with voting rights for black people and you know women's liberation for what like a generation so and we've done that imperfectly you know against the backdrop of backdrop of extreme inequality um and corporate control so i don't i don't i think to me you know the question is like can we can we deepen democracy and go and go further and how do we cultivate those instincts so rousseau's paradox is how do you create an undemocratic people i sorry how do you create a democratic people out of an undemocratic people and you know, sort of what comes first, right? Democratic structures are the people who demand them. And I think we're just always, we're always in that loop, right? I mean, so that's why I'm building a debtors union. I'm trying to create an association to, uh, that, that might inspire some people who feel very uh, dispossessed, cynical, disengaged to come together and see themselves as, as uh, political subjects who, de who can demand more. Um, I think you know, that's why I write and try to communicate and try to create the space for people to engage philosophically, you know, outside of the classroom, um, uh, you know, outside of the sort of expected uh, context for this kind of discussion where you can talk about Plato and Rousseau and, and think about these kinds of ideas. Um, you know, and I think this is also why I wanted Will to be here as like a representative of the youth, sorry, Will, but it's like, you know, the younger generation is <laughs> like really politicized. And um, and is questioning capitalism, is questioning whether this you know is democracies you know it, it has um, it has broken I think with a lot of the the American myths that were much more prevalent even when I was growing up and 
And, you know, and I, that gives me a lot of democratic hope. I mean, there's a lot to be really concerned about and, and we're up against, you know, huge entrenched interests and power structures. But, you know, I see a lot of democratic spirit um, from people who are coming of age right now. I mean, you know, and, and that is something that I think we should recognize and then try to cultivate and encourage more of, um, mm -hmm. because I think it's, it's, you know, I, I see that as one of the biggest hopes of this moment. And then the question, but then you can't be like, okay, the kids have got to do it. Cause it's like, we all got to do it too. <laughs> and what do you think? Will, well, young person. Well, I, 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 I think in answering this question, I, I think it does kind of go back to this conversation that we were having about uh, Wendy Brown's conception of neoliberalism last night, that there is a, a kind of right wing turn that has happened, you know, since the, the, the high tide of the anti Vietnam War and the civil rights movement that has, I think, effectively aimed to depoliticize people. Yeah. And I think we are kind of like uh, living, I think, you know, since, since, since Occupy and, and um, Black Lives Matter and, and the Bernie Sanders campaign, we are seeing this resurgence that is you know, saying that there, there is, there is an alternative, uh, another world is possible, right? Um, but I think, um, you know, I think part of, part of my, like, political involvement, especially here on the local level, was, you know, kind of happened, Trump, Trump is in an office, and the police are trying to, um, trying to install surveillance cameras, we might not be able to have, have leverage on the federal level, but we can have leverage uh, here in our, in our own town and, and raising uh, a ruckus um, and staying persistent and, and staying uh, trying to trying to um, trying to trying to trying to do democracy at least you know in town here was something that we could do uh, and and are continuing to do and I think to me that was sort of like the answer to these questions you know although. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, we're, we're seeing kind of the issues that we're looking at are, are, are global and, you know, our, our, our police chief uh, wanted to, to train uh, and le learn how to do counterterrorism training in Israel. And we see, we start to see these kind of global connections happen, you know, in our own town. Um, so I think for me, like answering that question was, was kind of rolling up my sleeves, you know, here in, in Northampton and, and starting the shoestring with um, my friends Jules and 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 Harrison. Um. Yeah, one of the things for you know for young people, it's always like, oh, they're so apathetic, and we chide them. But then the minute they get active, like you know, Will and his friends, they're like, stop, <laughs> stop, stop attending all these you know city hall meetings and being a pastor. You know, it was the same with Occupy, right? It was like, oh, silly Occupy, it won't accomplish anything. Don't they know that they should run for office? And now that a bunch of lefties are running for office, you know, um, <laughs> people are this, the, the the power structure is incensed. So um, be well, careful what you wish for, I guess. <laughs> well, it's, it's like what all the kind of liberals. We, we want more kind of minorities and, and people of color to run and, and young women to run. And as soon as they kind of question the economic system, then they, then the the people in power get kind of frustrated and get cold feet about what they said five minutes ago. You know. <laughs> There was a question about whether you were inspired. Mm -hmm. Carol Polsgrove asked, do you want to un unmute yourself, Carol? Can she unmute herself or do you have to do it? Well, ever? I didn't have anything to say other than what I already put on the chat. Was she inspired by uh, Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which came out in the early 19th century, 1830s. And I'm especially interested in that question as you're talking about youth, because he was around 30 or a little under 30 when he did that. He was a young man and he was like a young journalist to come over. And he was out there trying to see what democracy looked like in America. And I wondered, you know, if you read it and thought, oh, things haven't changed, they have changed, if you had any thoughts about your two experiences. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't inspired by, by Tocqueville, but I think he, um, he's obviously a touchstone, right? So read my Tocqueville as I wrote my book. And, you know, I think, um, you know, it's, 
interesting to measure the present against some of what he discovered and um, you know lauded about America. So our tendency, you know, to form associations, right? This kind of and an assumption also that there would be a degree of economic equality that hasn't been maintained. I think going further back though, it's important to remember that what actually brought Tocqueville and his buddy, whose name I forget, to the United States was that they did a, they were actually working on uh, prisons. They toured almost, I think they toured every major prison in the, in the United States at that time. It was a study of the penitentiary system. So that's also really interesting at this moment too, to think about how we're having uh, you know, what's called often a reckoning around racial justice, around police brutality, around the fact that we claim to be the world's leading democracy, but we ha also have per capita the most incarcerated people, um, which is, you know, why that scene with Ellie Brett, the barber who is incarcerated is so crucial. And to think, wow, did to like Tocqueville, actually that it's, it's the prisons that brought him uh, mm -hmm. to this That's continent. And that we have built a concept of freedom based on unfreedom, right? This is something else that Will and I have thought a lot about. Will found this great writer, Aziz Rana, who wrote this book called The Two Faces of American Freedom, that our our conception of freedom was has been based on, you know, I'm free because you were enslaved. So being, you know, a democracy that was um, uh, intertwined from the beginning with the enslavement of uh, people from the African continent and also the dispossession of ind indigenous people. And then today, you know, you know you're free because you're not in prison. And there's something about that that I think for me, you know, we need to break that. The idea of, of understanding freedom in contrast to that, um, that, um, that kind of unfreedom and to come to, you know, this, this a positive version of liberty that we actually, are free because we're together <laughs> supporting one another. So that's, I think that's where my thoughts about Tocqueville go today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I had a question. I was sort of didn't know if I had to wait to be called on. Yeah. Right. So uh, a couple of things, I'm gonna to try to keep my thoughts organized, mm -hmm. but uh, to Will's point about local action, like. I'm an activist, I'm, I'm in Extinction Rebellion. We're working on a new arm of rebellion called Money Rebellion against yeah. the finance and political economy, um, which will be launching soon. But um, so the thing is like, yes, I absolutely of course agree um, about local action and, and direct action and um, participating. But I guess my concern is that those who would act against our participation in our own governance have for at least decades probably much longer, like uh, specifically like the neoliberalists, uh, neoliberalists um, have been coordinating for decades, you know, internationally on their like well-worn um, paths of sort of like influence communication power, right? And coordinating against us. So while yes, like I, would, I love the idea of, of acting locally, I feel that to be effective against such a system <clears throat> the people themselves would also have to start to think transnationally and transcend borders and, um, you know, set up those same kinds of systems of communication and collaboration for ourselves. So, like, I just feel like there's more to it because that may work well for one locale, but, you know, it's, I don't know, I, I want for more than that, you know? Um, and I wonder, oh, sorry, if there's any response to that, I will shut up for a moment with my three-part question, sorry or comment. Um, no, why don't you keep going and then we'll just do it all at once. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, you, you're probably familiar with uh, like Daniel Schmachtenberger and his war on sense making, where he talks about, you know, uh, highly recommend, he is an amazing theorist. And he talks a lot about how we got to where we are today and where we're gonna end up if we don't make drastic change, which is probably unlikely. Can you and say his name slowly? Yeah, and I will also put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, Why don't you just do that? Okay. Yeah, it is a delightful name that, that rolls off the tongue. Um, I can also find the YouTube that's in and throw it in there. Um, so Daniel Schmachtenberger, he has like a, I think five, if not more now, um, series on YouTube. He also um, is a writer and it's called The War on Sense Making. And he basically talks about how to essentially like in the distraction shell game, to keep us distracted from what's really going on and divided and fearful of each other. And they've spun these narratives, right? And they've spun them so successfully that 
neither left nor right has a clear view now of what's actually going on, that mm -hmm. it has negatively impacted our ability to make sense of the reality and the world that we live in and has just fractured and twisted and melted sort of an objective thing, right? Because we used to, maybe decades ago, left and right would you know, still agree that this is a pink pad of paper, but they would just be seeing it from two different sides. Um, whereas now we can't even agree that that's yeah. a pink pad of paper, right? And so that kind of um, siloing of our society and fracturing of reality, because um, like neither one of us like quite sees the whole picture, given that we're inundated with so much propaganda and messaging on a scale that's never existed before. And so even if like, I want to, I'm, I'm not trying to be doer. I'm, I'm, I'm just very, very like realistic about things. Like I do love the idea of hope in the younger generation and totally agree that we shouldn't be putting it all on their shoulders. But even if they're imbued with the sense of democratic spirit, um, like not only is the system, the system allows for stresses, right? And like the, like the steam to be let off and then knows exactly what it's gonna do to encapsulate it again. Um, they've got all their messaging ready to anything we could possibly think of. And so even with this democratic spirit, with a, a distorted ability to make sense of the world around us, how mm -hmm. can we fight successfully? You know, it feels almost, not quite, almost inexorable. Yeah. So, I mean, two thoughts. I mean, yeah, we are in a situation where we can't separate the local from the international. So I think Will did a good job of saying that, that once you understand the local, you see the way that the transnational, the international is imbricated in everything we do, right? I mean, every product we buy, uh, you know, every, uh, you know, decision we make, we're on Zoom right now. So the money is being channeled to a, a locale far distant, you know, distant from where I'm sitting. I think my, so in the book, I have a chapter about the local and the global where I explore this tension. And you know, the thing is we don't have a mechanism to jump up to the global level and impose democracy from on high, right? There, mm -hmm. there aren't transnational institutions. You know, there are transnational institutions, unfortunately, that are pretty undemocratic, like the World Trade Organization. And, um, you know, the, so there are kind of, you know, market mechanisms, you know, but we don't have an international EPA an international tax collector international labor organizations very weak you know and so we have to we have to build those and i just i don't think you can skip the local level right we need we need the sort of local we need the sort of meso level we need the, the macro level and you know we don't have there, there's not some strategic fix that can just allow us to fix things um on the larger stage i think we have to figure out like where we are what power what levers of power can we wield right so right now we're facing a we're we're about to have a an election in this country and so we get to you know vote that's the the probably the most significant political lever of everyday people for this specific moment in time and then after that we have to go back to our communities and be like what can i be part of <laughs> you know so it's a question i think it's the strategy question really depends on where we're situated and who we're in community with um you know, but certainly my organizing around indebtedness, you know, we're trying to show people that literally the most intimate, it's not even local, but the most intimate thing of like who you pay money to at the end of the month is connected to this international structure of finance, right? Will you put something in the chat so we yeah. can, Yeah. and Nancy, yeah. Nancy Stark had, wants to say something. Yeah, and then on the sense making, we just have to keep trying to make sense. I mean, that's what we have to do. And I think part of why I, you know, what bonded Will and I was paying attention to sort of the business model of the internet and journalism, you know, and part of why there is so much disinformation right now is, you know, the underlying economics of the, the platforms that we're using every day, right? They're, they're basically surveillance capitalism is one way of call, you know, calling it, but, um, you know, there it's, um, it's, it's not an economy that is built to subsidize uh, you know, long, long form journalism or long form thought. And so that's what we're up against, right? And so I, I think we need to pay attention to those larger structures and those businesses um, instead of sort of lamenting, um, lamenting people's capacities. I just want to say one oh, thing. There was somebody named Nancy Stark okay. who said she who had a con. I just wanted to, to echo one thing and just say that there was a study that came out that said, you know, communities without um, a local journalism institution, uh, by and large, who, who are sort of inundated with misinformation from um, 
Mm -hmm. um, Facebook, those are the communities that went further to Trump. So I think this, this, to have a, uh, a, a water hole of information that is, I think, you know, truthful, accurate, and, and maybe even um, left wing is, I think, a, a essential to, to fight the, the corrosion of uh, sort of, I think what Astra is saying is this economic model that has, you know, captured our um, attention as well as, uh, you know, spewed all this hate and misinformation, right? Yeah, I just want to say that what is democracy is I'm Canadian. I grew up in Georgia. It's produced by the National Film Board of Canada. It's a publicly subsidized, just like we want to celebrate libraries. This is a film that was subsidized by, by the state. And I never could have made this film in the US because it's not a marketable I mean, this film. This film, what is democracy? It's, a, it's funded by Canadian taxpayers. And so you can get it for free in Canada. It's available like at the National Film Board of Canada's website. We have an American distributor. So that's why it's not free for Americans. But, you know, this is something, this thing about, you know, journalists are very reluctant to advocate for public subsidy. I think that's a huge mistake. I think we can figure out ways to publicly and democratically subsidize things. Um, you know, and this film is an example of that. I would have been laughed out of a lot of meetings with commercial film producers. <laughs> There's a wonderful publication in Chicago. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Called the Chicago Reporter. It's been around for years and years and it was covering race and politics. And it it didn't have a funding source. And so they got a nonprofit organization to support them and that was going well for years. And recently there's been some kerfuffle in the politics and they just fired the editor. So it's not a free lunch. Um, I mean, the freest journalism that I did was when I worked for the University of Michigan Daily because it's a major university and student activity fees go to support it. Mm -hmm. So when you have a financial base like that, you know, yeah. we, we do need to find those. Nancy Stark has been asking to make yeah. a comment. Can you unmute yourself, Nancy? Or can you unmute her, Heather? I think she uh, left the, the chat. Oh, so hopefully she'll come back if she still wants to ask a question. I don't know if she'll come back. Well, I wanted to make a comment about local and going from the local to the um, global. A lot of, it would take money to do this kind of journalism, but take a, take a town like Northampton. So you get involved in wanting to do various kinds of progressive things in the town through your local government, but you're squeezed because over the last 30, 40 years, we've gotten less and less state funding for things that it was assumed the state paid for. And the federal government gave money both directly to municipalities and also through the states through education, through mental health, like that. Um, now we have this defund the police and we want, we have this idealistic vision. We're gonna have social workers and all these different kinds of services going out. There's no money, um, there's no money for it. And um, I just say, say and how much where is the money going? Well, in fact, where is the money going? To our defense budget, the percentage of money uh, from our income taxes that go to the top have been siphoned off for defense increasingly, increasingly, increasingly. And we are trying to run a city on, prop on property taxes. And people don't look at that. You know, they, we can, it, it, liberals vote, vote for overrides for property taxes. And if you don't vote for it, you're considered a bad person because Oh, you don't have kids in the school, you're just selfish. But you can't run communities like this on property taxes with the kind of services that are expected. But people who look local don't wanna look up and say, well, why, why were we able, why was New York City, when I was a kid, New York City had the most unbelievable services for middle-class communities. Mm -hmm. um, I think these issues of budget, uh, you know, I just wrote a, wrote a piece in The Intercept about state and local budgets. I think these are the fights that are gonna really come into focus in 2021. Um, and 
and a, a recognition that you know the federal government can <laughs> spend when it wants to. We just saw you know a huge COVID relief package, and you know I'm I'm focused a lot on debt, so we had a lot of corporate debt relief, um, whereas municipal municipalities are being left. Uh, there is this municipal lending facility, but only two loans have been made at very onerous terms. Um, which begs the question, why is the federal government lending to cities that are in need when it could be spending on the services, you know, uh, residents exactly. need? So, um, so I think we're going to have some really, I, why I like the defend, defund the police call is that it makes you think about, well, what is the budget? Whose money is this? You know, as, right. as Stephanie Kelton, a uh, prominent economist says, you know, a budget is a moral document. It's about our priorities. That's um, what city councilor Bill Dwight says during uh, every one of these meetings and, <laughs> and then pontificates about God knows what, but. <clears throat> but yeah, they always have extra billions for the military, you know, and, and whereas it's when we want healthcare and things like that there. I, I do want to respond to the comment, which I take, you know, about um, my, my saying we've never really had a democracy. I do think it's important to think, to look back and say, we did have in some respects for previous generations, more economic democracy than we have today, right? So you, know, you could go to college for free at the University of Berkeley <laughs> before uh, Governor Ronald Reagan imposed tuition, right? You could buy more <laughs> with your minimum wage. Um, uh, you know, there were forms, I think there, you know, there was less economic inequality. But I, I do think it's hard for me to look back at American history and say we had a democracy when we had, you know, exclusions uh, based on race, <laughs> uh, based on gender, based on sexuality that are still with us today. We haven't, you know, resolved those. We haven't, uh, you know, eliminated those disparities. And now we have, um, you know, wealth inequality that's absolutely staggering. So that's why, you know, I think we should look back and say, okay, yes, you know, uh, you know, I appreciate the progress that's been made that people have fought for. And I can see that in some ways, you know, we can look back and, and see things that might be, you know, more democratic or preferable to the present. But I, I in, ultimately, I, I think that, you know, a fully inclusive, <laughs> robust democracy is, is not something the United States has, has ever had. I mean, if you look right. at the treatment of indigenous people in this country. Um, if you look at all the exclusions, you know, based on citizenship, which I think, you know, are, are pretty arbitrary in lots of ways. Um, yeah, I, I just, I think democracy if, is still on the horizon. Well, I think uh, you have to go, Astra, and I think that is a great place to end it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you, Astra, so much for joining us and uh, to everybody for um, all of your uh, Excellent and insightful questions. And uh, thank you, Carolyn, for, for having us. Thank you, Heather, for <laughs> making this possible. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Heather, too. You and Forbes. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, viva libraries. <laughs> yes, uh, go watch all of Astra's uh, movies that are available at the Forbes, <laughs> Forbes Library. And one thing, it's I want to say one thing about libraries, but I don't you know, yeah, it's opening a Pandora's box. Be careful of public-private partnerships. It's a slippery slope to privatization, which means the end of it being public. And so many libraries and other democratic institutions, parks, but you know, the friends of the park, and pretty soon they're in charge and they tell you what you can do in the park. We want to keep our libraries independent so that the librarians run it, not the funders. Yeah. So well, that right now our funders are the second that. Oh. What did you say, Heather? What? I just said, you know, right now our, our funders are the taxpayers of Northampton. So um, good. You know, that's who we so. Are, so yeah, and su support support your local journalists wherever wherever you are too. Well, we got to find a gig like the libraries do. <laughs> well, we we have to have public journalism, so the so the journalists are funded by the by the taxpayers and, and not the funders because I mean the the advertisers uh, and the the very, that are such poison. You know the BBC people pay because you have to have a firewall. If we had public. Uh, public broadcasting and it isn't so public anymore. It lost its congressional funding for the most part. Yeah, tax Google and fund journalism. You know, I mean, that's the thing. Every community needs to have, you know, at least one full-time journalist at City Hall. And the thing is, 
most American communities don't have that right now. So that's, that's a right. huge And a labor reporter. The New York yep. Times used to have a labor reporter. Yep. Yeah, so I think defending public goods is really important and digging into this budget fight in 2021 um, because, yeah, we can't separate democracy from these economic arrangements. And I think that's where, when we've thought of democracy as a purely political thing, whatever that means, right, is, is part of how we've been led astray. Um, and so I, I, I have, I guess if I have any hope, it's that we're, that's going to change, um, you know, in part because the situation is so dire. But out of desperation can come creativity and energy. Yeah and renewal. So let's be part of that. Thank you all for having me and thanks Thank everyone everybody. for watching. I'm so grateful. It's been Thank great. You. Bye. Bye.